welcome everybody. This is the second session of the Rebel Wisdom Book Club. And I'm very pleased and excited that we've got um, Tim Lott as our special guest today. Uh, Tim is a novelist and journalist. Uh, he won the Whitbread Award for his first novel. Uh, he teaches creative writing at the Faber Academy uh, and the Guardian Masterclasses. And Tim, for his a uh, book for book club. He's chosen a book by um, the British philosopher and uh, mystical communicator Alan Watts, and he's chosen the book uh, "The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are." Tim, welcome to Rebel Wisdom Book Club. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Thanks very much. And so, uh, in just as a brief kind of intro, um, why did you want to uh, this? Why did you choose this book? Well, I suppose I, Alan Watts has, I think, written about 30 books. Um, and to me, there are three that are crucial. One is this, the book. The other one is the wisdom uh, of insecurity. And then the, the, the third is the meaning of happiness. Um, all those are, are beautiful primers to his, to his work. Um, and this one I, I picked really because although he a, he's a, has a, a brilliant he has a brilliant habit or technique of expressing the most difficult ideas in the most simple, imaginable terms. Um, I always found the book the most challenging in many ways. Uh, and, and, you know, although someone like Alan Watts, interestingly, is, is quite often dismissed by proper intellectuals as not being sufficiently um, deep or serious, which I think is a very, very unfair criticism, actually, He's, he just doesn't indulge in the obscurantist language that so many philosophers and, and intellectuals um, do. And I'm not an intellectual by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a novelist, so I'm much more concerned with sort of images and pictures and, and expressing things clearly than I am comfortable with. You know, I, I find it very hard to sit down and read a, you know, a chapter of Hegel probably. Um, in fact, I know because I've tried. Um, and uh, I think um, when I read someone like Watts, he's he's coming to people like me, um, who are people who are curious and interested and reasonably intelligent, um, but don't have any particular training in that way of thinking. You know, and, and I think yeah. there's a certain point where philosophy takes off into a, into a sphere and it takes off quite quickly into a sphere and it's very, very hard to access. And that, that's partly deliberate, I think, by philosophers, but also um, it's got to do with the fact that philosophy, in, in, in the way I think of it, has lost its way in that it doesn't inform you of its original intentions, which is who are we, how we should live, how we should behave, very fundamental questions that the Greeks were asking two and a half thousand years ago and, and, and um, that are as valid today as they've ever been. Um, and yet one looks in vain for people addressing these as, in an intelligent and accessible way uh, until you, I mean, there are a few, I, I must agree, uh, accept. Um, but Alan Watts, I think, outshines them all, partly because of his uh, clarity, but also his sense of humour, which is very unusual in, mm -hmm. um, in any philosopher. They're not noted for their comedy routines. Um, but if you sit and listen um, to a Alan Watts lecture, you know, you, what you hear from the audience is often is laughter. You know, he's he called himself a spiritual entertainer uh, or a genuine fake. He was a trickster. He was someone who didn't take himself very seriously and refused to take the world very seriously. Um, and as somebody myself who sees life as a mixture of tragedy and comedy, um, and, and 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 thinks it's as absurd as it is meaningful. And it is meaningful, but it's also absurd. And someone like Alan Watts speaks to me absolutely directly. And, and, and he, he's no question at all that he's 
changed. I don't like to use the phrase changed my life because that sort of sounds a bit like born again Christian. But I mean, he's, <laughs> he's changed my inner life. He's changed the shape of my thoughts. He's, he's altered the way I imagine the world to be. And he's mm. made me believe beyond any doubt in my mind that the, the, the version of reality was served up by mass media and the education system is, is, is grossly inaccurate, really. And I think, you know, as, as he says himself, to get to at the beginning of the book in the preface, you know, the, only, the problem with grasping it is firstly in a way that it's so simple, um, because simple ideas are the hardest to grasp, mm. um, but also that it, it simultaneously turns your whole world upside down. Everything that you thought was the case turns out not to be the case. Um, everything, if everything you thought was bad turns out to be good. Everything you turns out thought was um, was you turns out not to be you. I mean, I could go on um, to a tedious... OK, before, before we get into the book, um, Dan, that was a great intro, by the way. Thank you. Um, should we have a quick look at his life, just in case people... I, I think he's, he's pretty well known. He's probably one of the best known spiritual teacher of the 20th century but he had an interesting life definitely compared to most philosophers most academic philosophers um should we have a quick look at that um as i understand it he was um something of a child prodigy is that right he wrote his first book uh, the way of zen when he was 15 i think wow um he was he was he was a, he was a zen buddhist when he was at school um, uh, and uh, the school he was at, which I think was Winchester, were kind of very liberal about that sort of thing. I think he says, oh, Watts is a Buddhist. What, what? Um, let's have, let him investigate that. And sure enough, he wrote a book on Zen Buddhism, which to this day stands up pretty well. Um, so he certainly was a prodigy. Uh, do you want me to yeah. take out the story, as it were, of, of his... Of, of, of... Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm interested in... The fact that he was this this young prodigy, he wrote this this book when he was fifteen. Uh, he was already at the World Parliament of Religion when he was uh, eighteen or nineteen. So he was, you know, right there at the start of Buddhism uh, in one of the first kind of Buddhist centres in the UK. What what I don't quite get is that then he somehow became a priest, didn't he? This person who'd rejected Christianity as a schoolboy. Is that right, that he, he became a Christian priest? Well, he married a Buddhist um, and moved to New York just on the eve of the Second World War. Um, and then I, I think he kind of needed a job, um, you know, and, and he became um, a... Uh, my mind has gone blank. What the American name for the uh, Anglican Church? Episcopalian. Exactly, the Episcopalian Church. He became an Episcopalian minister and, and, and teacher um, in New York. Um, and then uh, he was, um, he was, he divorced his wife and then moved to California um, and worked in a seminary within the university there. I think, I think it was UCLA. I could be wrong, one of the Californian universities. Uh, and, and, uh, hooked up with another um he had a lot of wives i think uh, at least three um and uh, even more children eight i think children um and um he was basically while uh teaching at the seminary it was discovered that he was having a menage a trois with um with not only his wife but a, another woman um and they're all sort of living together in the church residence um and once that got out there was a scale this was the 1950s we're talking about um and he was therefore drummed out of the drummed out of the seminary by the bishop um and uh he was then it was at that point he wrote the wisdom of insecurity uh, another great book because he was found himself basically um well i wouldn't don't know about penniless but certainly had a lot of kids to support and he he's divorced his heiress wife, 
Um, and he was in a sort of state of despair to a certain extent. But then he got an invite to set up what you might, the, the, the School of Asian, uh, Asian American Studies, I think it was. I haven't looked at, I haven't re- done my homework for this, but uh, uh, mm-hmm. it's basically the, the equivalent um, of uh, the African and Oriental Studies in London. Um, yeah, um, the uh, American Academy of Asian Studies, which which became the what's it called now? CIIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is still going. That's right. So I think yeah. under a very different management, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and then he, I mean, it's kind of a long story short. You know, he he basically started to become. It, it's it's wonderful to look at the photographs of him. He starts off as this incredibly starchy looking. English gentleman, you know, who looks rather like a vicar, country vicar, with a very slick back hair. And he always, you know, for a lot of his career, dressed in this very classic English gentleman style. Um, and then he kind of, by the end of his career, he <laughs> it's like, you know, he, he exploded into this whacked out hippie who would not have been out of place um at a as a at a as a bean, which in fact he wasn't. He was at the first bean in San Francisco in 1968 with the Grateful Dead and um the Jeff Snare playing and Alan Ginsberg. Um and so he's quite easy to dismiss as a sort of crazy old hippie. Um but um but he's not, you know, he was also an alcoholic as well as a womanizer. He certainly wasn't a dull character, um, and um, and yet throughout it all, he maintained uh, this extraordinary clarity. And certainly, if you listen to any of his lectures, from what I can learn, I I, I tried to write a book on Alan Watts, which my publishers sadly were not sufficiently enthusiastic about. Um, but I, as a result, I went out to interview his, 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 some of his children, most notably his son, Mark, who runs his estate. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, Alan Watts was drunk during most of those lectures, but you'd never guess it. Um, and he, you know, he, he never looked at his notes. It was all off the top of his head. Um, and so he went from this sort of English clergyman, child genius, to this basic Timothy Leary drug culture um, guru, certainly looked the part as well, but never lost. I I personally am very hostile towards what you might call the the new age uh, and find it sort of pretty absurd on the whole. And, and, um, you know, people who are going around hugging crystals and so forth. But I I think what I like about Alan Watts is... um, you know, despite his image, he was having none of that. I mean, that, that's what kind of what I like about him. He's he he, he had that sort of English pragmatism, and uh, if I may dignify it with that, compared with the sort of Californian, slightly. I, I'm sure there are Californians here, which I do not mean any disrespect, but um, back certainly back in those days, it was, you know, pretty whacked out place, and I think you know he always kept this very very pragmatic, practical side to him. He was an English empiricist. He was a skeptic. You know, he would never, he, he never took it as far as a Deepak Chopra might, you know. Um, and did he, um, I mean, so he, when he left Christianity, he didn't convert to a particular religion. I suppose I associate him with Zen a bit. Like he, he did popularize and introduce Zen to like the beat poets. Um, but he he never he wasn't a Buddhist or or, or, or Taoist or, or he no never... he wasn't he right. says explicitly that he he, he he opens several of his lectures explicitly saying I'm not a Buddhist I'm not a Taoist I you know I'm just someone who finds these things interesting right um, and mm. he wouldn't sign up to any program in that way which I also like about him very much um, mm. and uh, no he was. In the end, from what I can understand, um, he was a, he was more Taoist than anything else. I spoke right. to the man who wrote his last book, The Watercourse Way, 
with him and he was saying that basically he'd, he'd pretty much gone over to Taoism as much as he went over to anything. Right. But he was much too complex a character to sign up for any particular creed. And he was very anti that sort of thing, you know. I mean, although he's he, called the book, you know. Was he a, a, a guru? I mean, did he have followers? Well, he also says, I am not a guru. You know, I mean, he, he says, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a spiritual entertainer, as I said. He, he would never take himself that seriously. And he certainly didn't think anyone should listen to what he had to say about anything without making up their own mind about it. In, in that, he had a lot in common with the Buddha. Um, you know, he, he was very much uh, an individualist um, and very much, a, you know, a breath of relief after the terrible constricting conservatism of the, of the 50s. Um, but I think he got sort of swept away. I mean, in America, he's still quite... Uh, iconic, I think. In England, no, no one has heard of him. No one gives a damn about him. I mean, I, 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 I tried to sell to many media outlets, outlets the 100th anniversary of his birth um, to try and get on talk shows to talk about it. One, one, one broadcaster, national broadcaster, start the week um, with Andrew Marr did bring me on to talk about him. Otherwise, total indifference. I couldn't get any, couldn't get any articles out of it, um, yeah. which I think is bizarre. But you know, it, it's, it's sort of reassuring in a way that it always seems to be the smartest people are the most ignored people somehow. Right. Well, and maybe profits aren't appreciated in their own country, and maybe that's why he left Britain. Um, so, uh, tell us about uh, the book. What what is the taboo that he refers to in the subtitle, the taboo against knowing who you are. Well, the taboo... He makes it sound kind of, it's a nice kind of flip or, or a technique. He makes old spiritual wisdom sound kind of naughty, uh, which is a kind of clever thing to do. So what is this taboo that we shouldn't know, but he's going to tell us? Well, I think, it, I think the central taboo is that you are not who you think you are. And I suppose what we all think we are is a little bag of sensations hanging off an individual planted inside our head that's cut off from the rest of the universe and is a rather helpless and pathetic creature in the face of uh, a world and a universe that is entirely indifferent to us and essentially alien to us and which we are this absurd fluke of consciousness that's appeared like a slime on the surface of the earth, uh, a crazy accident, and that basically we should live our life afraid and isolated. Um, and that's the kind of what you might call the modern myth of what the individual is, and it's very much based in the science of the 19th century and the 18th century and the idea of the scientific revolution and the idea that, you know, we're a bunch of meaningless atoms floating around in space, going nowhere, having come from nowhere and going to return to nothingness. Um, and uh, which is pretty much what I believed until I started reading his work, uh, because that's what everyone believes in my culture. We're all atheists here, not like America, where there's a lot of religious people. Um, you know, people are, are scientific materialists. And, you know, I remember going out with, um, I had a lunch with someone who was the head of the science documentary program, programs at the BBC. And she was talking about, I don't know, science and materialism. And I said, well, I'm not a materialist. And she looked like, she looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I right. just doesn't add up. You know, you think it's so <laughs> obvious, but it's it's kind of ridiculous. And you know, and she looked, she really was so shocked, you know, because she thought that I was someone of some standing, I suppose, um, that I would automatically subscribe to this ideology. But the idea that, in fact, not only are we not this isolated, I mean, one of the most telling 
phrases he uses is that we come out of the world, not into it. And that really st stuck with me, the idea that actually we emerge as intelligent fields of energy from this much larger field of energy. And it's absurd to think that we are separate from it mm. and that somehow we are this sort of weird little freak of nature. He said, you, you know, he also said you, you don't get thorns growing on grape trees, you know, and, and, and therefore obviously the universe is intelligent because we are the universe and we are intelligent. Do you, uh, there's, a, there's a, a quite a, a, a good passage uh, where he talks about that. Do you want to, would you like to read that passage out or do you know the passage I mean about the earth peopling? I haven't got it at hand here. If you've got it. You can uh, read it, um, okay, but it's a very sure. good quote, yeah. The world okay. peoples. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Like an apple goes, tree, apples. Yes, he says, we suffer from a hallucination, from a false and distorted sensation of our own existence as living organisms. Most of us have the sensation that I myself is a separate center of feeling and action, living inside and bounded by the physical body. Um. Everyday figures of speech reflect this illusion. I came into this world. You must face reality, the conquest of nature. And then he says, we do not come into this world. We come out of it as leaves from a tree. As the ocean waves, the universe peoples. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. Beautiful. You know, and I think he's 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 absolutely. And when he when he puts it like that, you think, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, of course. Uh, and, really? and he, so he, when you read that, you, when you read that, did that uh, shift something for you then? Absolutely, shift. absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and also the the concept of things and events was also very big in this book, uh, the, 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 which is connected. You know, the idea that instead of there being multiple things and multiple events there's just one thing and one event and that was a very powerful idea for me um mm. and he also said the big bang is happening now which i think is also a very you know the idea that somehow it, it stopped or that you know it happened millions of years ago is still happening it, it, it's an it's a spontaneous act of creation that is eternal you know mm. and it's very close to god really not that far from a Christian God or a Buddhist one. So it's hardly surprising he was both a Christian and a Buddhist in a way, because those, those, those ideas are very close to his thinking. And I think he gets to the heart of both those religions in a way that, and I, I don't want this to sound um, patronising, because I don't mean it that way. And I don't know if you can patronise on the part of someone else anyway, but I think he made... Buddhism and Christianity much more cogent and believable than Christians and Buddhists can, you know, um, even though he didn't really subscribe to either. But he made it a much, he made a much more coherent argument for those things because th because they those those belief systems have become cluttered and confused by ritual ceremony history, exploitation, the church itself, the 10,000 bloody volumes of the, of the, of the, of the Buddhist literature, which, which he, you know, like a thousand Bibles time to, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, he, I think he said sort of, you know, he talks about like Buddhism, which I used to be very interested in until I thought of thought that it was incomprehensible. Um, and he said, well, it's basically because, you know, there's a lot of rather nerdy monks have been sitting around, you know, uh, producing these great screeds of the, you know, the eight great things and the 15 things you might, and this stuff. And, and it's all, you know, but at the heart of it, there's a very profound idea, just as at the, 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 in Christianity, there's a very profound idea. But to find your way into it through all the, unbelievable amount of distraction and wrongness simple wrongness is a real task you know simplicity for me i'm a writer and for me the greatest achievement is always 
simplicity, to produce the mm. simplest sentence in the most beautiful way. And I think that's his remarkable ability is that he writes simply and there's no yeah. hiding behind language. Um, and, and, and so, yes, I think he's... Uh, so he, um, I suppose, I mean, I, I love his work and of that generation that he was part of who were like synthesists and comparative philosophers and they brought together ideas from different traditions. They were cosmopolitan. Um, but I suppose a risk of that is that they might compare things that are actually quite different and, stay, and say they're the same. Uh, and so like, like Aldous Huxley might say, uh, different cultures call it the Tao or God or Buddha nature, but actually this is all the same thing. Um, and, and I wonder if that's also something we could say about Alan. Like he, he says this book is, is kind of influenced by Vedanta and he uses the Hindu idea that everything is God, but God playing hide and seek, that we are all part of one God, but we've got to realize the kind of divinity within us. But in a way, quite often he doesn't talk about God, does he? Uh, I, maybe I'm more familiar with him as a Taoist, where he'll talk about the kind of, you know, the all, or all of nature. Nature is a whole, nature is an ecosystem. And do you think there's... A, those are different things you know what i mean the hindu idea of god beyond nature when where nature is an illusion and then the beyond that there's god and then the taoist idea of you know nature is the as the whole system is 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 he kind of throwing it all in together in this book do you think that's a tough question i mean i would have to you know sit down and read the book from beginning to end to answer that question uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but in general, um, those are all nice distinctions you've made and, and, and fair ones. But mm. I, I think he's... Um, I think Maybe he's, he's expressing his philosophy. Maybe that's the way that... I don't think he ever expresses his philosophy. I think that he's an interpreter of other philosophers, you know, mm. in, and, and I, I, that's the interesting thing about him. I don't think he's got anything, and I don't think he would claim he had anything original to say. He simply is an interpreter. Um, and I, I don't think he's wrong about all these religions talking about the same thing. You know, I mean, they've certainly developed in different ways historically. But the idea that, you know, the very simple idea that underlying everything is a single thing, which is intelligent, that's it, really. You yeah. know, that, that's beginning and end, you know, and all those, all those religions do say that. I mean... Zen probably less so, but even Zen has got its, you know, you probably just call. I mean, I think Zen is the Buddhism of nothingness, but they mm. would just sort of say that nothingness was what held everything together. Same thing, really. Nothingness, God. I don't know. Um, what do you think of that idea in this book? Then that we are gods. We are all God playing hide and seek. It reminds me of something Ram Das said that we're all God in drag. <laughs> do, do, uh, do you do you do you kind of uh, relate to that yourself? Coming like like me as well from a kind of very skeptical uh, atheist culture. Uh, what do you think of that? Does he manage to make that idea of God palatable to you? Yeah, I buy it. You know, I don't see any way around it, frankly, because it comes back to the idea of if you're all if we're all one substance, which scientifically as well as philosophically we are, there's no getting away from the fact that, that there's, there's, there's only one single energy. Um, what else? How can, you, how can you even deny it? I don't, I don't see it's deniable, whether you're, whether you're religious or scientific. It seems to me obvious. Do you think then, because obviously... He doesn't really talk about the afterlife much, does he? Did, did uh, you come across that in your research? No, he doesn't, which I'm very pleased by. Right. You know, I mean, he's too sensible to talk about the afterlife. You know, yeah. he, he, he's not, he's not going to go there. I mean, the great thing about Alan Watts is, is his just common sense. You know, he's the sort of person you can read as, a, as someone who is a, you know, really hard-boiled English sceptic 
as I am, you know, and think, hold on, he's got a point here, you know, and, and, and gradually, because he's so skeptical himself, he preempts every objection you have. You know, I find that, you know, I'm going, yeah, well, what about, and then he goes, yeah, but what you're probably thinking, what about, you know, and he's got the, uh, he's already thought of that. So, you know, for someone like me, who was a very despairing, cynical, atheistic, agnostic, scientistic, 25 year old, um, and found it a very, very depressing place to be. And it's a very miserable, I think, worldview. Uh, but I thought it was the only worldview that was possible. And the mm -hmm. older I get, I'm 65 now, it seems an absurd worldview. You know, and, and Alan Watts is one of the writers who's helped me see it as being absurd. Uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and the way that, go on. Well, but, 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 but you, but he never, I mean, like, you know, you can compare him to someone like Ram Dass, where the idea of, of the afterlife and of the immortal soul is very important. That's obviously very important in Hinduism. So he, he has his own take on Vedanta, right? I mean, he leaves out karma. He leaves out reincarnation. This is what I mean by his own philosophy. But for you, none of you, none of that's important, really, that, that kind of side of it. You're more interested in the sense of being part of the whole, really. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't think he's sort of, he, he um, specifically denied reincarnation, but he certainly didn't push it. Um, mm. a, a, and, uh, you know, he was quite content to say, well, you know, we don't know. But, I mean, I don't think he believed in any kind of survival of personal identity. But, again, you can't really deny that things carry on when you're dead, you know, and the, the energy that makes you up carries on doing its thing. It's mm. obvious. Again, you know, he was merely pointing out the obvious. Yeah. And, and, uh, but our minds are so trained to deny the obvious in many ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. That it's very hard to, to see, but he's, he's wonderful at, at bringing out what, what, is, what he says the hardest thing to see is what's in front of your face. So he says um, we don't need another Bible or another dogma. We need a new kind of experience. He's trying to uh, give us that. So let's say you uh, as uh, you pick up this book and, and he gives you this experience. You go from uh, a sense of yourself as a separate being in a, in a bag of skin, in a world of objects in this, in this dead uh, universe, to a sense of, uh, of being part of uh, being it that you are it, you are part of it all. We all are part of the all. Um, what, what happens then? What do we do with that, according <laughs> to him? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, that would, be, uh, that would be Alan Watts' response to that question, I think, you know. Well, he, he does the, he which, which, which is called, called so what? what? Which is, what do we yeah. do with that? What does that even question even mean? You know, I mean, you don't do anything with it. You know, it, it's it just is. I mean, it just is. Yeah, it's not something you do anything with. And and I don't think, um, you know, I think the idea uh, you sometimes it's an it's an experience experiential feeling. I mean, I went through several years when I felt very very much like that, but you know, it passed. Things do. I don't feel very much like that anymore. But I still know it more intellectually now, but I've had the experience of knowing it emotionally. Yeah. And I, I'm now convinced by intellectually, which helps um, right. not to get caught up in some of the snares and traps, you know, that yeah. we all do get caught up in. But I don't think I'd go, I don't, I, like he says himself, it's not like looking through the world through, a, a, you know, a pink transparent jello. Um, you know, it's it's not like, you know, if anything, it's like, just walking slightly an inch or two above the ground, um, a, a lightness, you know, when it's right. when it when you when you feel it when it comes upon you, and it's not there all the time, because everything comes and goes, and you know sometimes I'm just as big a clod as the, as the next man. I'm you know, like like he was. He had feet of clay, as he would be the first to admit. Um, and I that I like that about. I like you know some people say to him, say to me, well. How can he be such a great thinker when he was a 
a drunk and a shagger and he's somebody who like essentially was a reprehensible human being so i say i like my heroes flawed you know i don't <laughs> i don't believe in gods and angels you know I, I i to me he was a human being and that endeared me to him greatly you know and he wasn't a great moral um avatar by any means but um <laughs> but he, he he knew how to enjoy life you know and i i'm not i really don't I, although i i like the idea of buddhism i really do not like the idea of chastity and sitting on the side of a mountain it seems chilly and you know he was yeah. very he was very much one to embrace the animal and human side of spirituality you know he didn't yeah. like the idea of, of us sort of floating off on a cloud somewhere he he appreciated beauty, uh, style, clothes, cooking, nature. That's my he, was, he was a, a kind of mystical Epicurean, wasn't he, in a way? Um, Absolutely. I, and also, can I just say, Jules, but I don't, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but sure. one thing I did note when I was thinking about this is he was unbelievably prophetic. You know, if you read in the in the book about the idea of there being a connected electronic brain that would bring us all together into a single consciousness you know and that was going to happen it was already happening within computers he talks he talks about that he talks about the env environmental catastrophe that's heading our way that you know that we're losing control of the planet he's saying these things in the 40s for god's sake you know i mean he's yeah. so far ahead of his time both in and he's saying them in san francisco so he's saying them about a mile from where Silicon Valley would start. Absolutely, you know, and uh, his vision, he's a visionary. You know, he was seeing these things way ahead of anybody else, you know, and um, uh, it's remarkable, really. And it's amazing in a way that he managed to take mysticism onto, like, you know, public radio. He had a TV show where he was yeah. talking about enlightenment. I mean... No one really before or since has taken mystical teachings so mainstream without kind of, you know, turning them into completely meaningless sound bites. I mean, that, that's quite extraordinary about him. Yeah, you'd be hard pushed to, to get a, a, a series commissioned by the BBC nowadays, or in fact, possibly ever, you know, because those things were on P PBS, I think, in America, in California. Um, and they were wonderful, by the way. I mean, I watched all of them. I thought they were tremendous. He was quite fascinating. And yeah. I'd love to see something like that, you know, shown on, on TV. Um, yeah. It would never happen. Um, but, you know, it's the kind of, it's the kind of knowledge that we, we need as a society and as a culture. We need animals desperately, I think. You know, mm. people are unhappy. People are unhappy and alienated and lost and, and a new generation are mired in mental illness. And there's a terrible despair out there, you know. And, yeah. and I'm not surprised, you know, because what's to believe in? There's nothing right. to believe in, you know. Um, yeah. and, 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 and to me, Watts represents the thinker who can say, yeah, there's nothing to believe in, but there's, there's also something called truth, and the truth is much more interesting and consoling than you might think. And I suppose it's a way for us to put down the burden of our separate self uh, and, and feel, you know, we, we, we are everything. We are all of it. It's not happening to us. It, it's all happening. Well, it's happening to us and we're doing it at the same time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all very well to say that, um, it's hard to pull off a feeling like that. I can't, you know. I mean, I, I, I can, I can certainly conceive of it in the abstract, but I'm just as childish and human-centered as as anybody. I mean, you know, I, I again, I, I'm not trying to put myself, but I can't. I wrote, I can't really bear spiritual people, and and I think, um, I think Alan Watts felt the same. He, he said, "We don't want the world to be like a giant Tibet." Um, and I, I thought that was a really good quote, um, you know, because it would be a disaster. It's part of the game that we should live lives of, of believing in separateness. It, it's so part he, of the game. He, 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 he didn't believe in kind of um, 
techniques and maybe he was similar to another Californian like Krishnamurti who was very anti any kind of technique other kind of spiritual teachers like the Maharishi would come and teach transcendental meditation or Vedanta they would teach you know Vedanta meditation but what wasn't into that and he was quite suspicious of the idea of self-improvement so you know he, he writes these books and they they talk about changing your vision but they're definitely not self-help books they're definitely not self-improvement books no well um, i love that about him i love that about him uh, um, know, it, um, is, why was that why was he not into that why why didn't he like the idea of he used practice to say, you or, know he said you, you know he said you're going to be the you're you're, you're going to be the same old slob you've always been you know which i i think that's a great thing for someone um who's supposed to be a self-help guru to say um and uh it's it's only a matter of I used to call Zen Zen practitioners the the aching back school of Buddhism. Um, <laughs> he, he really had no time for this kind of self denial. Um, he saw it as 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 life denying, and uh, I think that idea that he. He was perfect for his time in many ways, though he had many times, but he was perfect for his time in that he somehow managed to give a vividness to a world that had lost faith in in everything and still has lost faith in everything. Um, I've forgotten the question you asked now, Jules. What was it? I can't... Well, I, I wonder if we need some kind of practices some kind oh. of techniques um do, do, do you know uh is is he like krishnamurti slightly like leaving us on our own resources like do we sometimes need like okay i'm going to do a five minute guided meditation or i'm going to do this kind of breathing thing or something these days i feel like people are very into toolboxes very into like oh, i'm doing this practice or i'm doing that but but I just wonder what 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 you think whether you we we to some extent need those kinds of you know techniques sometimes. Um, well, do we? I mean, you know, basically, if they work for people, then fine. I mean, you know, I've I've I I feel rather like Alan Watts does about meditation, which is. Yes, all right. You know, if you feel like it, um, but it, but it's not. It's not the thing about meditation. It's not about achieving anything. That's why it's right. that you know. And therefore, it, you know, he's very against this idea that you know you've always got to be achieving things. And he had a real. Um, he had a real nose for spiritual elitism, for people who actually use spiritual practice to bolster their egos. Absolutely. So I'm more humble than you are. You know, or um, and uh, you know, he called them diaphanous people. You know, who really, who really wish that that the, the the body could disappear altogether. You know, and 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 you know, was disgusted by humanity in some level. Yes. Um, and I am, you know, I I love the human body, and I love food, and I love sex, and I love sunshine, and I love play, and I don't want to be this spiritual guru i mean I'm, I'm not anyway but you know but he was he was he, he he laughed he laughed a lot and he had the most wonderful laugh you know and i don't i can't really take seriously anybody who can't laugh you know and so many spiritual gurus don't seem to find themselves as funny as they should yes he he, he kind of probably set a whole fashion for that because the teachers who came after him like Osho and and so on. They 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 he made them all. You know they had you had to be funnier after Alan Watts. They probably all became comedians like Ram Dass and so on. But so he starts the book talking about ah oh, we're in this ecological crisis and overpopulation. By the end he's kind of saying, well don't try too hard to change anything. Least of all yourself. It's it's you know written in 1966. It's it's quite a mellow um you know uh i don't want to say passive but maybe passive uh philosophy 
for the middle of the 60s, for the turmoil that's all around him, for the kind of days of rage and the revolutions, um, was he, what was his relation to 60s politics? Did you come across that at all? I mean, was, was he slightly non-political? Yeah, he wasn't interested on the whole. Not I, mean, that, yeah. he, I mean, I think it was certainly recognised that those things have their place. And again, he would say that was part of the game. That's part of what those people do. But he yeah. wasn't one of them. And I'm not one of them either. You know, I mean, I, 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 I admire. Do I admire them? I don't know. I observe people who get very passionate about social issues. But on the whole, I'm, I'm rather of the, of the mind that people who are very morally certain are rather more dangerous than people who are morally in doubt. Um, and um, he was certainly someone who was morally in doubt. I, I, I did, it, Alan Watts, my favourite Alan Watts quote is, there's nothing so dangerous as a saint. And um, I, you know, I, 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 like, I like flawed people. I yeah. like people who are messy, you know, because they're human beings. And anybody who tries to stand in a, above and beyond and say, you know, I have this great insight into, into the world, well, I'm very suspicious of them. Yeah. Um, and we don't have that many of them, you know, perhaps Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> so as you say, he, he, he had his flaws and he never tried to hide them. No. Um, but he had a drinking problem. He had major alimony payments and it, apparently he had to just keep on doing talks partly to, to pay his payments. And he died in his 50s, yeah, in his uh, early 50s, I think. Was uh, he was born 54. in 19... He was born in 1905 uh, and he died in 1973. Yeah, it was early 50s. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 he died young, but um, but he, 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 he was much loved by, it seems to me, by his friends. What about his children? What do they um, what do they think of him? Like you say you met his son, Mark, and maybe his daughter's who edited his letters. What, what, yeah. what did they think of him? Was he a good dad? Well, um, I think they liked him a lot more than his wives liked him. Um, his wives really, I mean, his last wife really hated him, I think, as far as I can make out, uh, a lot. And probably with good reason. Um, though I couldn't possibly say. Um, but um, he wasn't the most faithful of men. Um, and uh, uh, the children of his I talked to were very fond of him, uh, and uh, and certainly Mark was very fond of him, uh, and they found him to be a a warm and loving father. Um, uh, uh, and I spoke to maybe three of the children; I can't remember now, but they were all very positive about him. I'm, I'm sure you can would, find some that weren't. And would he take LSD with them on their 18th birthday? Now, I've heard that story. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it would surprise me. And also, yeah. I wouldn't condemn him for it. Um, but uh, better that you take it with your father than, you know, alone in a, you know, I don't know. Warehouse. I, I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's a different age anyway. And I think we were all in an <laughs> age of experimentation. And uh, I certainly yeah. wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't. Um, I certainly wouldn't give approbation to everything Alan Watts did. I mean, by modern standards, I would say that he was a he was a deeply amoral man. Um, but at least you could say that was somewhat in keeping with his philosophy generally. So before I um, open it up to the audience, who I think I think I'm sure will have their thoughts on Alan Watts. I'm sure a lot of them are fans as well. Um, could you tell us a bit about what, what happened to his um, ideas, his work, his reputation since he died? Uh, I, I get the sense that he's still very popular. Is that the sense that you got, or particularly in America? Well, he's certainly picked up a lot. I mean, it's interesting how the media haven't really picked up on this country, but, you know, I think we've got Van Morrison writing songs about him. We've got other pop stars writing songs about him. Notably, I can't remember her name. She was a footballer's wife. Um, uh, Cheryl. Cheryl. Cheryl Cole, Cheryl Cole wrote, wrote, put, had an Alan Watts speech. There was her. 
the film, which features Mike Jones film. Alan Watts, we've got um, he, he's he's referred to frequently in popular culture, and, and one does feel that he's, uh, of course, the um, the creators of South Park did a series of con- cartoons about him, which are also rather wonderful. Right. But he's kind of, and, and I know that Johnny Depp is a fan, and and, and Jeff Bridges. But he's a kind of open secret that the, the, the sort of he's the sort of guru for artists and showbiz people, really. I mean, I don't know. There are, but to the man in the street, they've never heard of him. You know, most people. I, I've I've got a dream that if I ever get a a, a multi-million selling book, which is about as likely as Alan Watts resurrecting and coming back to um to to. to Chiselhurst, where he was born, but I, you know, I'd, I'd love to, um, I'd love to sort of set up a memorial library to, to Alan Watts because I think he was he's an ignored and forgotten figure in this country, and I think it's a tragedy, you know, that someone that wise. I mean, there's not many people you could describe as wise anymore, um, mm. and, and he was wise, uh, and and how many people, you know, there were a few, you know, people like. J.B. Priestley were quite wise, I think, and 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 probably probably T.S. Eliot, and you know, there were people. He was the last wise man, almost, you know. And there probably have been a few since. But, <sighs> but it's interesting. So, what, is there any kind of commemoration of him in in the UK, like a, a, a plaque or or anything like that? Nothing. No. Yeah, that is. There's sad, nothing, isn't it? As yeah. far as I'm aware, maybe there's a plaque somewhere in. In his house in Chiselhurst, I, I've not, never gone and had a look, but I suspect mm. not. Um, mm. He's he's just he's just um, he's just not known, and and mm. I find it very mysterious. Whereas you might know very quickly, the Deepak Chopra or um, who was the guy who wrote the Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle. You know, um, I'm not disparaging either of those people, but you know that. To me, they're not in the same league, really. Um, but I think he's he's very popular on places like YouTube. Like he's one of the most popular spiritual yeah. teachers on YouTube, so he he is very known. People love um, setting his talks to music as well. Yeah. This is a, and to kind of collage videos. This is yeah. uh, with like epic orchestral music. But he's obviously got a great voice as well, doesn't he? He's got a wonderful voice. I'm mean, to listen to him. Yeah, he's, people he's, like to just put on some Alan Watts and roll up a joint. Absolutely, like it. <laughs> and um, it even works without the joint. And 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 they <laughs> and you know certainly if you've read him, it's just not as good as listening to him because he's, he's you don't get voices like his anymore. They're practically <laughs> just, they're practically disappeared. They've practically become extinct. But it's a it's a voice full of humanity and laughter and warmth. Mm. And intelligence, and it's a it's a wonderful thing to hear, um, and uh, it's very seductive, um, yeah. and, and probably why who who I don't can't remember who made that film with Scarlett Johansson about with Alan Watts in as as a kind of but you can understand why they chose Alan Watts with his voice being yeah. so hypnotic and 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 uh... yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to open it up to. Um to questions uh, and comments now uh, from our audience. Um, and we're, we're, we've got about uh, 30 minutes for this. So if you've got a question, just could you keep it um, not too long to give uh, uh, as many people as possible the opportunity to just put their thoughts or questions uh, to Tim. Uh, and you can raise your hand or um, you can um, you know, press the button uh, to put your um, digital hand up and I will try to um, spot you. Um, so- can I just take it yes. off the chat because I've just noticed it? Yes, yeah, sure, Tim. Yeah, that's and, a good uh, idea. I'll, yeah. I'll shut up after that. It's from yeah. Brian Mummery who says, if you can't get a biography published of Watts, would a novel about Watts be a possibility? And I I have written that novel. So oh. um, I've, it's a novel called The Last Summer of the Water Strider, and the central character is a character called Crazy Uncle Henry, and he's Alan Watts, basically. Um, so if ever you're interested in that, it's it's absolutely based on him. And uh, so thank you for that question, Brian. What a good idea. Brilliant. Um, now, what else? Uh, 
did someone raise their hand? Um, yeah, we've got Stephen. And then thanks. there's a question in the chat as well. Thanks, Ella. Okay, Stephen, do you want to go for it? Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for all the information and stuff like that. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, so Tim said about um, the um, it being obvious about all the energy. Uh, everything's just energy. So sort of quantum physics and stuff like that is kind of obvious in that way. But I'd, I'd be curious to sort of understand better what he means by in, in terms of the way it's interpreted in a, well, maybe not spiritual, but energy, that kind of way. It, it, what's, what's the obvious bit? And could you explain a bit more about that? Okay, well, the obvious bit to me is simply that we are conscious beings and we are composed of that energy. It's that simple. You know, and uh, there's no, I mean, I know you, 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 you can complicate it, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's nothing I know about myself except this, is that I'm conscious. That's all I know about myself, really. You know, and, 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 and that's the most fundamental piece of knowledge I have. If you want to put it to a second, it's, it's that, you know, I am finally nothing different from everything else around me. Um, and if you put those two things together, it, to me, it becomes blindingly obvious, you know, that there is a kind of intelligent force operating within me. We see um, a, a, a monist, like, I mean, I, I guess that there are people who think there's like consciousness and then matter uh, and that there are these separate things, or some people think there's just consciousness, some people think there's just matter. Uh, what, does he spell that out? I mean, I, I get the sense that he feels there's just one thing, which is kind of mind stuff or mind matter stuff, but the, 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 I, I don't get the sense he's a dualist. What? what did you come across no, he's, an he's not a dualist, um, but he's um but yeah, he called everything thing events, didn't he? I mean he used okay. that he invented that term thing events because things we think of as being things, but they are in fact events. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a thing. <laughs> everything is an event because everything is happening, everything is unfolding, as it were. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he, there, there's, there's, no, there's, I don't, I don't think he was. Um, he, he, he would, he would describe, I think, something like a crystal having a primitive form of consciousness in that it reverberates when struck. You know, I'm not that convinced by that. You know, I, I'm not, I can't quite work out. How, I don't think you know all matter is conscious or anything like that, but maybe it is. I don't know, you know. But I mean, I, I, I find it hard to you know imagine the consciousness of a ballpoint pen. Um, but uh, you know, I, but I, I, I can see his point. You know, that you could see these in, in, inanimate objects as very primitive forms of consciousness. I don't really. I find that quite hard to grasp. Right. Okay. Thanks, um, Ella. Do you want to read out? Um, the, the next question, if you've got mm -hmm. it up to hand. Um, yes, unless Chelsea wants to unmute and read it herself. Go for it. I can unmute you if you want. Oh, there you've done it. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so the thing that tends to get to me is that it does make sense, like you were saying, Tim, that the ultimate ground of being is one connected entity of a sort. Um, but when he talks about the game of black and white, he says, you know, essentially, if we're thinking about this as a game of hide and seek, that, you know, once we've found our true selves, so to speak, then the, the game is over for a while. So then that brings me to question, what is morality? And is there such thing as a morality? Because if the game is to continue, then white can never win and black can never win. And we need them both. So, and like, and I think I resonate with the commentary strongly about, I like my people flawed. Like I could run 10 miles every day and only eat the best organic food and never have sex that wasn't spiritual. You know, like I could do all those things, but it doesn't feel right. And I think that there is that un unearthing sense of like needing to have both, not just purity, right? 
Um, but what does that mean for morality? Because we know that that would then have to include something that we would consider bad or naughty or being a drunk or being a shagger, as you said, you know? So what does that mean for how we're supposed to live in this world? And do you think that's why he left all that out? Just like figure it out for yourself. There's no wrong answer if we're all part of God and love and all that, you know? Yes, well, it's a very good question. And um, it's not an easy one to answer. Uh, because I think it's a very, I mean, I think he, had, he talked about it a lot, but it's a very subtle answer. Um, and I'm not sure it's an entirely convincing one, um, although I kind of buy it, um, which is that, um, I mean, he talked about Hitler, for instance, as being a force of nature, like a hurricane, really. You know, that, that, that and he did sort of, he also said, I thought quite wisely, that his philosophy was not for everyone. And it would be pretty disastrous in the wrong hands. He think he, he thought 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 that was why it was hushed up. That's why it's a taboo, because if it wasn't a taboo, and people got hold of it, they could just say, "Well, you know, if I go and murder somebody, yeah, it's all part of the necessary black and white game." Um, therefore, where is morality? Um, and you know. You could misinterpret it that way. I think his point would be on the on the subject of morality is that um, shall we call it evil? I don't know. I'm happy to call it evil, but you know, immoral behaviour is is really always caused by characters, societies, personalities that are out of balance. And you know that if you're in balance, you, you just don't want to do those things. You know, it's not a question of having to stop yourself doing them. You don't have any desire to do them. You know, and that that's that's. I mean, it's that he quoted some ancient Christian mystic, or I can't remember. It might have been might have been Meister Eckhart, but no, it wasn't Meister Eckhart. But he said, "Love and do what you will." You know, in other words, you know, don't. There's no set of rules. He was very against moral rules. Um, laid down by the state or religions. I think the idea was that you'd intuit your way through these things. And I kind of believe that's true. I think if, you're, if, you're so, if your soul, if, you're, if I can use that word, is in accord with the Tao, if you like, it's, in, it's, it's, it's not out of, too badly out of balance, then you're not going to have much propensity to do evil. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I think um, I think another thing is this is actually, I think Jordan Peterson came up with this point, actually, rather than Alan Watts, but it was it's something I didn't know, which was that the word sin means to miss the mark, which I thought was quite mm -hmm. interesting. In other words, it's just really a mistake, you know, because I, I, I might be naive, but I don't think evil, immoral people are very happy. And certainly the ones I've met who are pretty horrible don't seem very happy people, you know, and I, I don't think how rich and, and, and powerful, you know, Putin is, you know, I, I don't think he's a very happy guy. You know, I mean, I, I could be wrong, you know, but I, I believe that good people and happy people are usually quite much the same. Mm. Might be naive. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, have we got another question in the chat, Ella, lined up, or should um, I ask one? There's a little one from Phil Shankland, if he wants to. I'm not quite sure how it relates. It might be better if he expresses it. It doing. depends what you're referring to, Ella. Uh, the one that when you put a comment, is this David Bombs in cricket? Ah, oh, yes. Fascinating, David. this, uh, Tim. Thank you, by the way. Um, David Bohm, a quantum physicist, wrote the best book, allegedly, I've not read it, on quantum theory. His, his big idea um, is that um, the, 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 the physical material world that we're all so familiar and apparently attached to, it, he, he calls it the explicate order. But behind that is this field of quantum potential, um, which which he calls the implicate order. And if you think of it as sort of a, 
a 3D landscape of, of contours of hills and valleys that is there behind the, uh, the material. Um, uh, the big question it leaves for me, though, Tim, is whether that background mm, buzz of quantum energy it might be intelligent, but is it lovely? Is it benign? Is it warm and cuddly? Or is it cold and tactless? Well, I mean, <laughs> Alan Watts would say it was clearly both. But, you know, and, and that uh, these forces... Of, of, of negative and positive fight each other. But he would also say that in the end, the positive always wins, somehow. And I kind of think that's true. Um, and uh, partly it's true because we're here in the first place. So the positive must have won, <laughs> somehow. Because if, if the negative ever won, then there'd never be anything ever. Is that is that answering your question, Phil, or is it talking on a different point? No, no, it's blatant optimism. There's no no, <laughs> no grounds there, Tim, for <laughs> evidence. That you, your life might be fine. Somebody else's might be a bag of shit. So that that doesn't sound to. Yeah, well, I'm not denying that. I mean, you know, bag, being a bag of shit is all part of it. You know, and my life's been a bag of shit plenty of times, um, and. Uh, I've, I've absolutely swum in that shit. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that I've lost faith in um, in things being able to change and change for the better. And for the worse, for that matter. I'm interested to hear if, um, because I, I, I've, I've written a bit about Alan Watts and I, I, I know that he has been very important to lots of people. Uh, in the way that he has to Tim as well, in terms of um, often, yeah, of, of releasing people from like depression and this, uh, 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 having that impact on how they see themselves in the world. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious as to whether uh, anyone here, uh, whether Watts has had an impact on other people here. Uh, let me know. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear. Um, yeah, Max, would you like to? Um, uh, I mean, yeah. just to. Um... Yeah, just just to highlight what you said, uh, Alan Watts for me was a huge, huge influence. Um, I would say he's the only because uh, well, I look for all religious tradition, and eventually I found my religion is Alan Watts. It's just uh, it seems like it is able to capture all the essence of a different uh, tradition because it's like. Uh, you know, only when you see things from different perspectives uh, do you have the capacity to uh, to assess better what's going on. So, because he, he really considered the full spectrum of the you know um, religious belief, but be really open-minded about it, he somehow managed to transcend uh, each and every one and bring something that for me is even uh, stronger than any single one uh, on its own. I know it's a big statement to make, huh? but it's sometimes it's only like very uh, much later that we can truly appreciate the work of somebody. And I think uh, Alan Watts is greatly uh, uh, misunderestimated because, uh, and because he talks very simply as well. He's not willing to indulge into the jargonite that many intellectuals uh, indulge into. And for me, that's really the mark of genius. You know, he doesn't take his audience for fools. He fool, he makes a fool of himself just because he, you know, he trusts his audience and he wants to give something to them instead of like uh, trying to, uh, you know, be a peacock. So I really appreciate Alan Watts. I think he's, a, he's amazing, and uh, we need more Alan Watts. <laughs> so what do you make of that, Tim? Is 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 Alan Watts, uh, I don't know if you'd say necessarily he was your religion, but is he someone that you go back to a lot, that you kind of, you, um, you find yourself coming back to repeatedly? Is he, is he kind of a, uh, a, a companion along the way? Or is he someone who more like made that difference to you when you were, you know, th those years ago and, 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 and that's bit, well, it sounds like you've done lots, lots of work on him since, of course. Well, Thank you, Max. I thought that was a, a great what you said, and I, I really couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think he's uh, 
a remarkable figure. Um, and I, I, he, he, even as we, you know, speak, I, I, I listen to his. I, I tend to try to experience his his work in different ways. So, like the book, for instance, I quite recently listened to an audio book. Um, and that's probably the fourth time I've I've read it or experienced. And I've obviously watched his lectures. Um, there's so much to take in, um, but he's so he's so bloody entertaining about it. It's it's not um, it's not a you know I'm, I'm quite intellectually lazy, so it's quite um, it's it's quite pleasurable for me to sit and read a writer who I can get stimulated by um without having to hurt my head um and 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 also i think it's very interesting how he's it's very telling how he and this picks up on something max said how he's been scorned and ignored and when he came to cambridge in the last years of his life they just ignored him they didn't when well, they snubbed him Cambridge University, that is, you know, um, uh, uh, when he was at the peak of his fame, he just thought there were a bunch of stuffed shirts and they thought he was a charlatan, basically. Um, mm. But I'm more on his side than theirs. Uh, but he's often dismissed as a charlatan um, because, he, you know, he, uh, uh, not only has he got an image problem looking like a whacked out member of Led Zeppelin in his later years, um, but he's also got the problem that he doesn't offer what most so-called gurus and self-help people offer which is sort of you know karmic believe and everything will turn out right if you just sort of know the secret then your life will and you the universe will gather around your wishes you know he wasn't having any of that you know it's just he, he was he was neither a bleak nor a, a ludicrously optimistic one but he was he was not a mystic in the sense of selling anyone a pop. You know, he was relentlessly committed to truth. And that I do admire greatly. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to tell anything. I mean, I think his great quote was, um, you know, trying to get rid of insecurities, like dropping, jumping off of a cliff, holding onto a rock that's falling at the same time and hoping that the rock will give you security. You know, it's, it's, in other words, it's impossible. And he says, there's no escape from insecurity, there's no escape from death, there's no escape from uncertainty. But celebrate that. You know, and 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 I, I loved him for that honesty. Mm. Thank you, Tim. Um, so if any, if there's a last question, uh, stick up your hand now. Or and and uh yes, uh, Zach, uh you got a nice good last short question. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's like I, I'm. You can hear my accent, uh, or maybe you can't. I don't know. Um, I can hear all of yours, and it doesn't really matter. It does matter what you say, Jules, but it always sounds, you know, smarter than if I were to say it. And the same for Tim okay. and Ella. And I'm I'm wondering, and even and even Max, you know, he's got a French accent with his English, and and there's just something somewhat exotic about that. And as you all were giving examples of some new age thought leaders at Deepak Chopra and uh, Eckhart Tolle. Oh. Um, so is there something about, and, and it was very refreshing to hear that idea of he's not revered in the UK. That was, I, I had no idea that that was the case. So I'm wondering, is there something about the exotic accent that brings with it a sense that all of the other cultures or languages or religions or perspectives have been explored and therefore something about that comes in. It's, it's a mixture of something we know, a language that we speak and think in, English in this case, and something that we don't know, which is that twinge of the, the accent and the exotic that says, oh, this person has been somewhere else and seen something else and they've integrated it into a, into a truth that we can we can hold on to i don't know if i said that very well but oh, no you up, said it perfectly and it was very i had never thought of that uh, uh, but it does a lot to explain why alan watts was so popular in, in in america perhaps because yes he would have seen pretty exotic i think um in a way that he wouldn't have seen exotic at first anyway in england it would have just been another sort of parson really um but um 
but he would have looked, I'm sure he cut a very eccentric and romantic figure on in California, that's for sure. And they were they the the mystical teachers who came from the UK and went to California, like him and uh, Aldous Huxley, and there's another called Gerald Hurd, they were all like posh, basically. So in a way, it was easier for them to go and teach in the States, whilst if they were, if he was teaching in the 50s and 60s in the UK, everyone would be like, who are these posh people talking about the mystical? So I think that helped them as well. Yeah, very good question, and, and it's a good point. Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to chime in 100%, because I've been a language teacher going through the ropes from language schools right up to university till last year, and the accent is a killer both in terms of what comes towards me, the expected ways of how they want me to teach and who they think I am and how it projects out and what power it has and what power I don't want and sometimes have had to exert because of the, the institution. So, yeah, it's a mm. super interesting topic and I'm sure it did him a lot of good. <laughs> yeah, and Zach, I think you've got a very intelligent voice. <laughs> yeah, to us, it's, it's exotic, Zach. Um, <laughs> Finally, Tim, um, if we wanted to get to know Alan Watts more um, and go deeper, um, you've mentioned The Wisdom of Insecurity as another great book to read. And the other one you mentioned was... Uh, the, 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 um, the Meaning of Happiness. Meaning of Happiness. Um, I've yet to read, but I've heard his book about psychedelics, The Joyous Cosmology, is, is, is meant to be a, a classic as well. What about all his talks? I mean, there's so many of his talks on uh, YouTube and so on. Any you can recommend him or is it uh, you can't go wrong, in anywhere? You can't go wrong, but to track down his, you mentioned earlier his TV series. I can't remember the, the channel, KFPC or something, but it, it, it was a university channel, I think, or maybe it was a, a, a public channel. But the, his lectures on there, of which I think there are maybe, I don't know, a couple of dozen, uh, for for TV are, are great, you know they're very yeah. very very good indeed. So that's a very good place to to, to start off, I think. Um, Brilliant. Uh, if you just put his his, I don't know what you would Google on that one. But oh yeah, yeah, you can find it on YouTube. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Tim. It's been a real pleasure uh, to just share in your um, in your enthusiasm for Alan Watts uh, uh, and. You, you've, um, I think you've definitely inspired me to, to get deeper into his work. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us now. Next month in the, in the book club, we've got uh, John Vaveki. He's going to be talking about uh, a French philosopher called Pierre Addo, uh, another of my favourite philosophers. Um, and uh, an, an essay, I think it was, that Pierre Addo wrote called What is Philosophy? Um, there's another, there's a great book by Pierre Addo called Philosophy as a Way of Life, which is also worth looking at. So we're going to be doing that in a month's time. Um, I believe that, uh, Ella, do you want to just, um, thank you as well, Ella, for, uh, for helping us and, and, uh, organizing this. And, and, uh, do you want to just say about the, the thing that other people, some people are yeah. going to, or what? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Tim, very much. Lovely, wonderful to be here with everyone. And I really enjoyed the, all the comments and questions for everybody. Sorry we didn't get to breakouts, but um, yeah, there was a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, so I just posted a little link above, the one with the two times where it says 9.30 UK, 4.30 EDT. That's for the transition space meeting. If anyone wants to go along to that, you're more than welcome, where they're talking about the member-led handover for Circle. And I'm going to put another link in here now which is that one which is if anyone wants to just continue the discussion you could pop into that as a, a coffee shop link when this room shuts so the first link is for the transition space meeting about circle and the second one is a another zoom room in case you wanted to just continue the conversation yourselves uh and just finally uh, should we all uh unmute and just uh say thank you to tim for uh for his uh wisdom and time uh, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, thank Tim. You. Tim, Tim nice. it was great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, 
check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.